Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the interactive webinar, The Beginning of the End, Pandemic Updates, Vaccines, and What's Next. We appreciate you taking the time to attend today, and we hope you find the information valuable. A few notes before we get started today. Attendees are in listen-only mode. The presenters cannot hear you. If you do have a question, take a moment to find the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. The panelists will do their best in the time allowed to respond to all questions, but if time does run short, we will be sure to respond to questions by email in the next few days. If you have any tech issues during the webinar, you can also use the question box and we'll do our best to provide support. A recording of the webinar will be available on both the American Company website as well as the Merrick YouTube channel shortly after today's webinar. Links to both will be provided at the end of the presentation. This is an interactive webinar that features poll questions. When prompted, you will have the ability to respond to questions from the panelists. Your responses are anonymous. The purpose of the webinar is to provide the latest updates on the pandemic and general information about the vaccines, but nothing presented today is intended to be individual medical advice. Always seek personal medical questions with your healthcare providers. Finally, the panelists today are not compensated by any vaccine manufacturer pharmaceutical company or federal agency. Their role is to help present information so that you can make the best decisions for yourselves and for your families. Today's panelists are Dr. Ryan Burnett and Ms. Samantha Dietrich, both with the life sciences practice here at Merrick and Company. Dr. Ryan Burnett is a vice president at Merrick and leads Merrick's life sciences practice. Over the past 15 years, he has led bio-risk management and laboratory design projects in over 30 countries, working with over 100 universities, biopharmaceutical companies, and government agencies. Dr. Burnett has led or supported the operational planning of infectious disease programs against nearly 2 billion in life sciences infrastructure. He regularly consults with the U.S. Department of State, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Department of Defense, USDA, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as many foreign ministries. Dr. Burnett is the author and editor of one of the authoritative volumes in biosecurity, entitled Biosecurity, Understanding, Assessing, and Preventing the Threat. His second book, Applied Biosecurity, Global Health, Biodefense, and Developing Technologies, will be available this spring. Prior to work in infectious disease consulting, Dr. Burnett held positions at Virginia Tech and Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Ms. Dietrich leads Merrick's portfolio of global health security efforts and has nearly 15 years of domestic and international experience in global health security, public health, pharmacovigilance in infectious and non-infectious diseases. With an extensive background in epidemiology, laboratory, and health system strengthening, strengthening and program management, Ms. Dietrich has worked with both government and non-government entities in Africa, the Caribbean, Central Asia, Europe, the Middle East, North America, and Southeast Asia. Ms. Dietrich currently serves as the lead for American Companies Global Health Security Program directing and managing a multifaceted series of projects related to, the, to global health security with an emphasis on biosafety and biosecurity. She is also the current chair of the Global Health Security Agenda Consortium, a global consortium of non-governmental stakeholders that support the multinational effort to build capacity to prevent and respond to infectious disease threats. Ms. Dietrich earned a Master of Public Health and Prevention Science from Emory University and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish from the University of Virginia. Ms. Dietrich has held positions at CDC, the Association for Public Health Laboratories, and the British Medical Journal. Again, we're glad you're here with us today. We hope you came with questions, and now I'll hand it over to Dr. Burnett. 
Thank you, Anna. Thanks everybody for uh, being here today. Uh, we know that time is valuable. We hope you, we really do hope you guys get some, some good information out of this. Um, I wanna start today with a, uh, a poll question. And this will give us an opportunity both to kind of see where everybody stands, but at the same time, figure out how to use this poll function in our uh, meeting today. So here's the question. Do you currently have any reservations about getting a COVID vaccine? You'll have three choices, yes, somewhat, or no. I'm gonna open the poll and uh, you guys should be able to uh, select your choice and then we will share the results. Everything will be anonymous, so don't worry about how you feel about this. All right, I just launched the poll. We'll give it about 30, 45 seconds for folks to answer. All right, I see it coming in. Got about 87% have voted already, 90%. Cool, this is working. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. So hopefully what you guys are seeing is that about 12% of those that responded say, yeah, I do have reservations. 33%, about a third of you guys, sort of on the fence. And 56%, the majority are saying, no reservations whatsoever. Give me that vaccine. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so that gives us sort of a barometer of where we are today, and that's very helpful, so we appreciate that. So I think, you know, the first question we want to be able to address for everybody is, you know, who is American and why we care? And this is really more about uh, why should you guys listen to us? You know, why are we invested in this as individuals and as a company? So I'm going to start with a little bit about who Merrick is and, and what we do. We've been around for over 60 years, over 700 employees. We've got uh, multiple offices in four countries, including, boy, well, that went forward quick, uh, including uh, the UK, Mexico, and Canada. Um, we, do a, we do a lot of work in a lot of different markets. So for example, our four primary markets are in energy, national security, infrastructure, and of course, the one you're gonna hear the most about today is life sciences. Uh, we do a lot with the federal government, obviously the university and academia sector, healthcare, uh, global health security, and others. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of background about who we are and what we do, but I think what's more important is why we do it. We, we actually do it because I think that all of us in the life sciences practice, and probably even broadly across America, we all feel connected to you know, the, the field of public health in general. So our team includes folks from a lot of different disciplines, including architects and engineers, scientists. My colleague here today, Sam, is an epidemiologist. We've got veterinarians uh, heavily invested into biosafety and biosecurity, and of course, risk and threat management. Uh, so I've got a really, really great team that I get to work with here. Uh, we do this because we actually care about the impacts of infectious disease and our ability to contribute to that. So what do we really want to get to today? We want to understand where we are in the spectrum of the pandemic. Uh, how do things look compared to where we were, say, uh, about a year ago now, uh, if you can believe that? And we want to learn a little bit about the basics of vaccine development, production, safety testing, uh, just the facts, right? Uh, as you heard, Sam and I, we're not being paid by, uh, you know, any pharmaceutical company. Uh, or any federal agency other than the clients that Merrick has and, and we've had for, for decades. So we want to we want to be able to just give you guys some really good straight facts and of course answer your questions. We hope you guys came with questions today. We want to give you a sense of what things are going to what may look like in the near future. We recognize that you know we like everybody else we don't have a crystal ball uh, but I think we can give you a good sense of where we're headed with things and of course we want you guys to ask questions. So our agenda is pretty straightforward today. Going to give you a good update on the pandemic where we are now. We're going to talk a lot about vaccines and hopefully enable you to address the question for yourself, should you get one? And then finally, a little bit about what's next. So to move us into part one, update on the pandemic where we are now, I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Sam, over to you. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Um, so to start off, we're going to talk about where we are now in the pandemic. Um, Brian, can you move to the next slide, please? 
So as Ryan said, it, it's been basically about a year now. Um, and uh, I think all of us can attest that it's really been long, uh, a long year at that. So since the COVID outbreak um, in Wuhan, China, uh, then be became a pandemic and a major global health security event, We've seen about three waves uh, here in the United States. And what I mean by waves is a surge in the number of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and, and deaths. Of course, their normal lives have been incredibly disrupted uh, in more ways than we could potentially possibly imagine. Um, initially, we saw shutdowns and closures, and then things began to reopen during the summer. And in some places, uh, right now, we're starting to see you know, further shutdowns, uh, which of course, has really had a tremendous impact on the economy, uh, not just in the US, but countries all over the world. Um, I think all of us can agree that we're officially experiencing COVID fatigue. Uh, everyone is tired of, of living like this. We miss our families, our friends. We miss having fun. Uh, we miss travel, going to bars, movie theaters, sporting events, concerts. We essentially miss normal life. Uh, but where we are now is really a, a critical window of time. The coronavirus is, is raging um, and the United States is, is facing what people are saying is a, a pretty grim winter. Uh, we're on track for about 450,000 deaths from COVID-19 by, by this month, uh, maybe even more. Um, and as we'll discuss a little bit later in this presentation, if we can safely soldier through these next couple of months, then normal life or at least a newer version of, of normal will be in within reach. Next slide, Ryan. So to um, sort of set the, the stage in terms of where we are in the pandemic, um, these next few slides are, are really gonna highlight um, some of the, the epidemiological data that is, that is available. Um, and this first slide uh, shows the, the risk levels for all 50 states. And as you can see by the red color, most states are at an active or intimate outbreak uh, risk level. A few states, uh, particularly in the northwest part of the country and parts of the Midwest, including the Dakotas and Minnesota, are orange, meaning at risk of outbreak level. So these risk levels are based on three key metrics. Uh, number one is the daily new cases, or how many cases are confirmed daily. Number two is an infection rate and whether the number of infections are going down. And number three is positive test rate and whether COVID testing is, is widespread enough to identify new cases. So as of February 1st, uh, a couple of days ago, there have been roughly uh, 26.3 million cases and 443,000 deaths from COVID in the United States. And over the last 14 days, daily new cases have decreased uh, by about 29% and daily new deaths have increased by about 3%. Next slide, please. So when we take a closer look at the daily confirmed cases, um, and this is shown as a seven day rolling average. Um, so since the start of the Timba pandemic, you can you can see where cases first peaked, um, essentially between March and April, and and then again during the summer, and really since November, um, up until up until just a couple of days ago, uh, we've really seen a, a, the third peak or surge in the number of cases, um, and and this is likely because you know starting in November uh, we had the holidays beginning and and people you know started to gather and and be indoors more because of the cold weather. Um, so we did see that you know, spike of uh, further number of, of daily cases. Um, but then we kind of have reached this peak in mid-January. Um, and, and really since mid-January, I've started to see a decline in the number of COVID cases. Um, even with this drop, however, the daily cases are still well over three times what they were during the first peak uh, of the pandemic in April and about double uh, the level seen during the US summertime um, surge. So I will say it's it's really impossible to, to actually know what the cause of, of the decline in cases and hospitalizations have been over the last couple of weeks, um, given that so few of the population has been vaccinated. It, it could be because some of the vac people have been getting the vaccine, um, but this also is, is likely because of, of changes in, in people's behavior, um, you know, such as traveling, gathering less after the holidays or, or wearing masks and physically distancing more in response to the surging cases after the holiday, holidays and, and certainly the news of hospital bed shortages. Next slide, Ryan. So when we look at the cumulative confirmed COVID cases, um, what is important to note about these case figures? Um, the reported case figures on a given date do not necessarily show the number of new cases on that day. And, and this is really likely because of delays in, in reporting. Uh, the actual number of cases is likely to be much higher than the number of, of confirmed cases. And, and this is because of 
testing uh, limitations. So as you can see, really since um, January of, of last year, 2020, we've really kind of had this gradual increase in the number of cumulative cases over time. Uh, next slide, Ryan. So when we look at hospitalizations, um, this is the total number of patients in the hospital due to COVID-19 on a given date. And similar to the number of COVID cases, the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 across the country has, has fallen, um, particularly over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there were about 93,000 people in hospitals with COVID uh, across the U.S. as of Monday. Um, and this is according to data from the COVID tracking project, which was uh, founded by journalists at the Atlantic. And that's where about 29% lower than the peak of 132,400 people who hospitalized with the disease in uh, the early, uh, early stages of January. Next slide. One note about hospital capacity and, and sort of the, the issues um, and, and concerns people have uh, when we mention, um, you know, the capacity of hospitals and hospitals, you know, being overstretched and, and burdened. Um, so even though we're starting to see a decline in the number of people hospitalized, there, there really are these concerns for capacity and, and the ramifications that um, this has. So, you know, whether it's a shortage of beds and, and patients having to be redact, uh, redirected to other hospitals, that's, that's one thing. Another thing, uh, another issue concern is, is the shortage of, of medical equipments, um, treatment therapies such as ventilators, oxygens, availability for personal protective equipment, the PPE such as face masks and 95 respirators, high protection disposable medical gloves and disposable gowns and, and one piece coveralls. Uh, shortage of beds, every hospital has um, you know, certain number of beds and, and once that all of those beds are, are full, there's, there's problems with that. And again, people have to either be redirected to their hospitals or um, just declined. They're, they're not allowed to, to be admitted because there's no, there's no room. Um, so when we have this, um, and we see that these hospitals are, are being overloaded, um, ultimately this, this really does have an impact on the larger health system, not just the individual health hospital, but the larger health system. When there are not enough doctors, nurses, and other specialists to staff those beds, uh, healthcare professionals are, are quite overworked, overwhelmed, which can it affect the quality of care that they are able to provide. And this can result in an increase in adverse outcomes, um, including, including deaths. So it's something that we want to keep in mind, even though we are starting to see a decline in the number of people hospitalized. We have had issues over time during this pandemic with uh, hospitals being too, too overwhelmed. Next slide, Ryan. So I mentioned, um, you know, number of cases going down. We're also seeing a decline in hospitalizations. Yes, uh, we are not quite yet seeing a, a major fall in, in the number of confirmed uh, COVID deaths quite yet. Um, and you know, when we look at daily confirmed COVID deaths, this is um, the seven-day rolling average. And why we we look at the seven-day rolling average um, is because the the daily data doesn't necessarily show. Um, or refer to the deaths on that day, but to the deaths reported on uh, reported on that day. So since reporting can vary uh, significantly from day to day, perspective of any actual variation of deaths, it's helpful to view the seven-day rolling average of the daily figures. Um, as I, I said just a second ago, deaths continue to remain high, um, and this is likely due to the significant lag between diagnosis and mortality rate, um, but we would expect to um, the deaths to begin falling, falling soon uh, moving forward. Next slide. So in terms of cumulative confirmed COVID deaths, uh, three key points uh, to keep in mind um, for this. The first is actual total death toll from COVID-19 is, is really likely to be higher than the number of, of confirmed deaths. This is due to limited testing uh, and problems in the attribution of uh, the cause of death. The difference between reported and confirmed deaths and total deaths uh, vary um, from within the United States and, and from country to country. So how COVID-19 deaths are recorded may differ between um, you know, countries. So when you're looking at from a, a global perspective, some countries may only count hospital deaths while others have started to include deaths in homes. Um, and this is something similar we're seeing in, in the US based on states where it's, it's really fairly hard to, to track sometimes um, deaths that occur in the community um, versus a patient who dies uh, at a hospital. Um, so the reported death figures on a given date do not necessarily show the number of new deaths on that date. And again, delays uh, in reporting is, is the main reason for this. 
Um, January uh, was the deadliest month so far in the United States, and the virus killed more than 95,000 Americans. Uh, the total death uh, toll for the U.S. has now surpassed over 441,000. To give a little bit of uh, perspective here, this is, this is more than a number of Americans who died in World War II. Next slide, Ryan. The vaccines, and Ryan is certainly going to get into um, more of a discussion about the vaccines here in just a second, but in terms of where we're looking at for numbers of uh, vaccine doses administered, um, this is showing the rolling seven-day average, and, and as you can see, um, really this is, you know, kicked off um, earlier in, in January, but uh, this is counted as a, a single dose. Um, it may not equal the total number of people vaccinated, depending on the specific dose regimen. So, um, you know, whether people have received multiple doses yet or not. So this is based on the single dose. And, and as you can see, there's, you know, there's been a slow rollout, some glitches um, uh, as we've, uh, you know, been administering the vaccine. Um, but overall, we, we have uh, surpassed 1.2 million vaccines uh, so far. Next slide, Ryan. And this is uh, the last of um, some the the epi slides that, that we have today. But um, I like this one because this is prediction. So this shows estimated infections for, for this year. Uh, it's projected data only uh, and the projected number of infections based on people wearing masks, uh, worst case scenario, uh, and the rapid variant spread, which, which Ryan's going to talk more about here in a bit as well. Um, so based on these current projections, and, and that's current projections is indicated by uh, the dash line that's sort of in that, I guess, maroon, <laughs> darker uh, maroon purpley color. Um, but based on these current projections, it's expected that we'll see an additional 100,000 or so new infections by the end of May. And then as you can see, if people do continue to wear masks at social distance, um, this number is reduced even further, as indicated by that green uh, dash line, uh, and is projected to be around 48,000. So cutting basically the new number of infections in, in half um, just if people get vaccinated and, and um, not wear masks. So you know, showing the impact masks can actually have uh, in terms of uh, predictions, projections for estimated uh, infections. Um, all of these scenarios here do include the vaccine distribution, so I wanted to make that clear. Um, and at some point, when enough people have been vaccinated, we'll really start to see the positive effects of the vaccine on the pandemic, especially if people continue, again, to wear masks, social distance. Uh, and based on these projections, we're really starting to we'll see a, a huge difference um, by the end of uh, springtime. I will uh, now turn it over to you, Dr. Ryan Burnett, to talk about the, the vaccines in part two. Uh, you make me sound so fancy, Sam. Um, yeah, we see questions coming in. Thank you, guys. Keep, please keep them coming in. Uh, we, uh, we, will, we will be getting to the questions here as we go through and, and closer to the end, so we are seeing them. Thank you for that. Sam, the one thing that I didn't see in your uh, in your charts was uh, the the decrease in the past year of people actually wearing pants uh, because we've been working at home. So I think that's the one negative of coming out of this. Everybody, we're going to have to put real pants on again. All right, let's talk about the vaccines now. For you biology dorks that are you know with us, I'm I'm one of you um, that are on the line today, and you're like, oh cool, I, I've really been looking forward to this sophisticated discussion. Uh, about the the intricacies of you know vaccines and and immunology, I have bad news for you. This is really basic. We want to keep this basic. Um, so I, I hope you can appreciate the the basic nature of what we're going to talk about today. But we want this to be informative, and of course, come with your questions. All right. Told you it was going to be basic. We're going to start right from the beginning. What exactly is a vaccine? You can see a very standard definition here in the first uh, bullet point. I think the you know the main thing that we're trying to get across here is a vaccine is really used uh, as a means to stimulate the production of antibodies, which is part of your immune system, to help build immunity. Uh, the very first uh, was the smallpox vaccine all the way back in 1796. Uh, so this has been going on for quite a while, and, and we've obviously gotten very good at it. Uh, today, there are hundreds of vaccines for humans, animals, and, and even plants. So I think uh, pretty pretty impressive field and uh, we would not be where we are today, I think, as a, as a species and a society without uh, vaccines. So how do they work in real general terms? All right, I like this graphic from the Mayo Clinic Health System, so I'll give them a shout out. 
This is a very traditional way of, of making vaccines. And, and we're going to compare and contrast this with sort of where we are today with the uh, vaccines that are coming out uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So in a very basic sense, uh, we take a dead germ, a virus, say, and we inject that into a person. Because it's dead, it can't actually infect you. But what we what the goal is is that the the structural nature of the virus itself is still intact so that your immune system and your antibodies recognized by these red y-shaped uh, cartoons here can still recognize it so you're priming your immune system and then what happens is if you ever get exposed to the real virus that's alive in nature you've already got those antibodies in your bloodstream uh, those things are already in your body and they're ready to combat uh, that agent. So what do I compare this to? You guys ever seen this? It's like, holy smokes, there's a cop. I'm going to slow down. And then you get up on it and you realize, oh, that wasn't a real cop. So it didn't actually have the ability to give you a ticket. But did it make you slow down? Yeah, it did. And that's sort of the, the, the basic premise behind vaccines. What we have today, and I think this is really cool, this is sort of a, a sign of uh, the advancements we've been able to make in vaccine technology here, and, uh, and, and even, even the biology around genetics and genome sequencing uh, has, has really enabled us to do this quicker and sleeker. Uh, traditionally, and there's still many, many vaccines where we grow uh, you know, just hundreds of liters of active live virus, then we kill it. And, and that is our vaccine. And uh, that takes a lot of time, to be honest, and it takes a lot of production. Things have changed, and now we have the ability to use these mRNA vaccines. So we're gonna talk about two things today uh, that are representative of sort of the two major groups of uh, vaccines that we're seeing being approved in the UK, the US, Canada, elsewhere. Uh, and those are the mRNA vaccines and the viral vector vaccines. So rather than injecting people with dead virus, we have the ability to just use a snippet of the genetic sequence of the virus, which is the mRNA. We're going to talk about what that is. The mRNA is actually injected into the person, and what's encoded in that mRNA is the M stands for messenger. Uh, so it is a piece of message that actually encodes a piece of the virus itself. And what it does is your body now takes that message and starts making that particular part of the virus that is not infectious. And that's what elicits the immune response in your body. It's really kind of cool. So in the case of the, the COVID vaccine, you know, if you've seen the, uh, if you've seen the images of, of coronavirus and it has all those spikes on it, uh, what these vaccines are doing is they are encoding through this messenger RNA, that actual spike protein, not the whole virus. And that's how these vaccines work. So there's the basics of, of your mRNA vaccine. I told you biology nerds, we weren't going too deep. What about the viral vector vaccines, right? So if you look at the mRNA vaccines, those are the ones that you're seeing from groups like Pfizer and Moderna. Your viral vector vaccines, now we're talking more of the J&J, &J, the AstraZeneca, uh, a similar process, but there's a little bit different delivery, okay? So your mRNA vaccines, the mRNA is actually packaged uh, inside these little fat droplets and, and your cells can absorb those so that the mRNA gets into your body. Uh, the viral vector vaccines, on the other hand, actually use uh, a virus that for all intents and purposes is not harmful to you, but we know viruses are very good at infecting our cells. Wow, that's kind of the perfect mechanism to insert, you know, the piece of messenger RNA into us, you know, in, infect us with the mRNA to make the, the antibodies that we need to make. And that's exactly what a viral vector vaccine does. Uh, so this is actually from the Royal Society of Chemistry. I think this is a pretty good graphic. Um, that little snapshot here of uh, the mRNA that you can see in that orange circle is encoded in the virus. The virus gets injected into the people, and then the rest of the process is very similar to what we just explained. To be clear, this is not the coronavirus we're injecting you with. This is a completely different, relatively harmless virus that has the ability just to insert the thing that we're interested in. So this doesn't make you sick. 
So let's take it just a little bit deeper, because I think this is important for people to understand how this works so that you can decide, you know, is this something I want to I want to to get? This is really all about the mRNA. We talked about messenger RNA. Well, this figure you're looking at is really sort of the, the central dogma of, of molecular biology. I think we've all heard about DNA. Um, we know DNA is sort of the, the information sink in each and every one of our cells. Uh, that's essentially you know, the, the information, right? That encodes everything that our body needs to make to do its thousands of jobs. But we have to be able to go from the DNA level to the protein level, which is the functional piece of, of things in our, in our cells. And the way that we convey that message is through messenger RNA, or here we're just showing sort of RNA. So we go from the double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, and that encodes ultimately the product we want to make. So, you know, we tried to come up with, well, how can we relay this, you know, from sort of an analogous perspective to other things? So I think that any, anybody who's ever been through sort of a, a construction process, that's sort of how I equate this. So let's look at the DNA. That's really the information. So here you've got the, you know, a computer simulation of a design, right? And that's where the information is. It doesn't actually do anything. It's relatively inert. So we've got to transcribe that into something that now becomes useful. We've got to convey that message and, and uh, maybe not so more, but at least in the old engineering disciplines, you know, you would make blueprints, right? And those blueprints would go from say the computer or the, uh, the drawing, the drafting table, now out to the, uh, the contractor to actually build what needs to be built. So in this example, the RNA is a lot like a blueprint that's being transmitted. Finally, that blueprint actually gets used by contractors to build something. And those proteins now have a function, right? Just like this building has a function. That's sort of the central dogma of how these things work. So now we wanna focus in a little bit on the mRNA side of things. So how are the COVID vaccines a little bit different? Well, as I explained before, instead of being injected with the whole dead virus, these vaccines use mRNA and viral vectors to deliver that message. Um, what's really unique about this is we're using the machinery that's in our own bodies, sort of as contractors, to really transcribe that virus mRNA, quote unquote, reading the blueprints, to make the product or build the thing that is the part of the SARS coronavirus. So what are we talking about specifically? The message that is in these vaccines makes that spike protein. It doesn't make the whole virus. You're not being injected with the virus. You're being injected with the instructions to make a single piece of that virus. And that alone is enough to elicit the immune response you need to make the antibodies that will be able to recognize the real virus when it does, if it does come into contact with you. So this is how we prime our immune systems. So if you think about it, am I telling you that you know, these vaccines were intending to inject you with a piece of coronavirus mRNA and your body into making a part of the virus itself. That's exactly what we're saying. Exactly. What about the variants, though? OK, a lot of questions coming up about, well, are these vaccines going to be useful against the variants that are popping up, as we've seen in the UK and South Africa and Brazil? So let's talk a little bit about what the job of a virus is. The biological goal of a virus is really to spread easily and rapidly. It has one goal, and that's to reproduce, uh, just like just about every other biological organism, you know, known to man. The job is to reproduce. So it doesn't make a lot of sense if the virus is super lethal. Uh, if it infects and then kills its host, how does it have the ability to spread to the next host? It doesn't. So in general terms, very basic terms, as viruses evolve and mutate, uh, their goal is to be as infectious as possible, but not necessarily lethal. So that also being said, that mutation is a normal phenomenon. Uh, mass vaccinations will actually slow this down, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So think about, think about uh, you, go to a, you go to a copier, right, and you've got a piece of paper, and there's something on it and you've got to make 10 copies. The chances of you screwing up and making a bad copy or an altered copy and one in 10 is pretty low. You're probably gonna get 10 pretty good copies. Now, what if I told you you had to make millions or even billions of copies of that same sheet of paper? 
Is it possible you might screw one of those up? Is it possible that one of those pieces of paper after that many copies might be mutated? Yeah. Is it possible that some of those mutations might give you an advantage? Like, whoa, I messed this one up, but I really like this one better. I'm gonna keep making more of this one. It's very similar to sort of how viruses work, right? So we're, we are gonna see these things. And, but then why are, why are these variants popping up? It's because the virus continues to infect millions of people around the world. And every time it infects and has the ability to make more copies, the, uh, the ability to generate additional variants also increases. Uh, so I think that a lot of us, you know, we probably don't know the full spectrum of the variants that are actually out there right now. So you can imagine now if, uh, if everybody got vaccinated, and let's, let's pretend in a simple world, it was real easy. Everybody got vaccinated all at once, and that sort of stops the virus in its tracks. We've really cut off its ability to continue to mutate. Now that's a very idealistic way of thinking about it, and that's not actually how it happens in real life. But the more people that do get vaccinated, each person has the ability to essentially stop the virus in its tracks and prevent it from becoming a variation down the road. Uh, so the, the, the vaccine uh, programs that we're trying to go through are not only just about protecting us from the, the virus and the strains that are out there now, it's really about slowing the overall uh, biology of, of the trajectory of the virus itself. So what do these viruses really mean, or the variants, excuse me? You know, we're still collecting data. Uh, you think about it, this, this virus really isn't that old. Um, and as good as we are, we're still learning an awful lot. So we are still to this day collecting data on how widely the variants have spread, how different are they from the original, is the disease going to be different? If you, if you become infected with one of the variants, is it worse? Is it better than the original in terms of the disease and the symptoms? And of course, how effective are our current vaccines going to be, right? Uh, I know that people worry about that. So what we want to be able to explain is that the bottom line is that getting the currently available vaccine is almost certain to provide protection against the original as it was designed and the variants. Why? Is it going to be as effective? Are the vaccines going to be as effective against the variants as they are the original? Um, maybe, maybe not. We're still getting a lot of data on that. But the virus hasn't been through, these variants aren't so different that the current vaccine won't have some efficiency in, in, against, the, against those variants. Uh, so the, the bottom line really here is that the, the vaccines that are available now, they are the best way to protect yourself against the original strain. And they are more than likely gonna present quite a bit of protection against the variants as well. That might set us up as we go forward uh, for thinking about, uh, you know, as this continues to evolve and mutate, are we going to need new vaccines and uh, boosters against some of these strains in the future? That's also very possible. Uh, but the main thing is we're collecting an awful lot of data at the moment, and we know we're going to keep doing that. All right. Let's talk about the myths. This is always one of my favorite sections. Been a lot of myths around vaccines for a long time. Um, so let's break some of them down. Vaccines cause autism. Probably everybody has had some exposure to this incredibly false message. Um, this is a this is a easily debunked and has been systematically debunked for years and years. Uh, we simply know this is not the case. Uh, this dates back really to some, in my opinion, some very false and very fraudulent data uh, that I think has had a very negative impact on how the world views vaccines. There is no connection, plain and simple. What about infant immune systems are too weak? Not always the case, right? We want to look at things. This is why we go through a lot of safety testing, and we're going to talk about safety testing here in a minute. Uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, vaccines are different. Infants are different, just like we're different. Uh, but to think that infants shouldn't be vaccinated because they are too feeble and weak, generally a false assumption. What about natural immunity is better? Um, I don't know. I, I think that not to be too crass about it, but ask somebody that survived polio infection. Um, I don't think that you know natural immunity is always the, the best case for us uh, for a lot of reasons, not included the not including you know the uh, the, the the possibility of of death, 
or lifelong conditions. If vaccines have the ability to prevent that from occurring, we're going to go that route every, I'm going to go that route every time. What about vaccines contain unsafe toxins? We've heard about, you know, the, the uh, lingering toxins and trace amounts in vaccines uh, as a result of how they're manufactured and how they're processed. You know, is there any truth to this that vaccines contain unsafe toxins? Uh, very trace quantities. The way that I like to explain this to people is if you've ever had a couple of shrimp, uh, maybe you've had a couple of oysters or a good piece of fish, you've likely consumed more mercury uh, in, in that single meal than you will have enter your body through all of the vaccines you will ever receive. Uh, so I think that uh, to say, are there unsafe toxins present? I think it, you know, we have to define what unsafe means and we have to take into context the levels of those things. All right, what about better hygiene and sanitation or better than vaccines? I'm a huge advocate of hand washing. Uh, ask anybody in my company, uh, it's become sort of my tagline. I'm always on people about washing their hands. Uh, these things are absolutely critical, right? Um, but guess what? Washing your hands isn't gonna prime your immune system. It's not gonna build the antibodies for you. And as good as hygiene and sanitation practices are and as necessary as they are, they're not foolproof either. Vaccines aren't worth the risk. Again, I go back to sort of my polio example. Um, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of uh, developing countries and I've seen a lot of the, I would say the lasting effects of infectious disease. Um, I don't know I don't know a better way to help, you know, sort of stem that global pain and suffering from infectious disease. Uh, I would, you know, without without vaccines having been present. Um, I think that we would argue that the the risk, the negative effects of having a vaccine are pretty minor. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the safety testing. Um, I think the I think the risk reward factor for vaccines uh, absolutely exponentially outweighs the risk of contracting many of the diseases that we deal with even still today. Vaccines infect you with a disease that's trying to prevent. Clearly not. Uh, you're not going to be injected with live COVID. Um, don't know how to state that any any plainer. What about I don't need the vaccine if everybody around me is vaccinated? I love this one. I actually have this debate quite frequently. It's like, you know what? I'm a little skittish about getting the vaccine, but you know what? I don't need to worry about it if everybody around me gets vaccinated. Here's the deal. Not everybody around you can get vaccinated. There are people that will have medical conditions that will prevent them from receiving this vaccine. Uh, do we, I think is you know, a bit philosophical, but do we not have an obligation to protect our neighbors and our communities? And I would say the answer is yes. This mentality of, I don't need it if everybody around me is vaccinated, if that was true, uh, you guys will recall not too far in the distant past, we were starting to see some pretty significant measles outbreaks in New York. Um, that's really crazy given, given how far we've come uh, in the spectrum of vaccine development. And I think that's an example of when too many people have this in their head that, hey, you know what, everybody else is gonna get it, I'm just gonna hang out with their borrowed immunity. It just doesn't work that way. The flu vaccine protects you against COVID. Hey, I got my flu shot. Do I still need to get the COVID shot? Yes, completely different viruses. Coronaviruses and influenza viruses are not the same at all. Uh, the flu vaccine is not going to protect you against COVID-19. Um, probably the one that came out of really left field was vaccines are used to microchip people. Um, you know, I, I, I really researched this topic because I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Um, if I could ever find a microchip that was functional that would pass through an 18 gauge syringe, I hope somebody's making a lot of money on that. Bottom line is it doesn't exist. It's not happening. Um, it's just uh, one of those conspiracy theories that unfortunately has made it out. What about immunocompromised or people with underlying health conditions? It's like, whoa, my health is already compromised. The last thing I need is uh, you know, a vaccine that's gonna make me feel crappy. It's the exact opposite. These are, this is a demographic of people that we wanna protect more uh, because the, the, the virus could have a stronger impact on people with health conditions and folks that are immunocompromised. Obviously talk to your medical care health provider, but in general, we want these people to get vaccinated. They're, they're at a greater risk. And we're gonna to touch on this in a minute, so I won't dwell on it, but the COVID vaccine was developed too quickly to be safe. It's like, damn it, I want my 10 to 15 year approval process before this is going in my body. 
And I would say, well, ask yourself, uh, are you the same person who was like doing shots of tequila off the ice luge at a frat party, you know, with 40 other people and you're worried about a vaccine that went through FDA approval? I would check your priorities. That's sort of my position. And I want to say, if I have any family listening to this, I never did that at a frat party, just to be clear. All right. This is sort of an example here of what's going on. You can see this tweet, and in the lower part of this, this gentleman says, what if we were actually meant to get mild childhood illnesses like measles to help prime our immune systems? And the guy above says, wow, you know, his head is really going to explode when he learns how vaccines actually work, because that's what vaccines actually do. You get the opportunity to prime your immune system without actually having to get the disease. Um, that's the benefit of this technology, and it's been around, as you saw, since smallpox in 1796. Uh, so this is this is not rocket science at this point. All right, moving on. Let's talk about safety testing. Um, we're not going to go too, too deep into this, but I want folks to have some sense of what it's about and the process that we go through. There's what's called the preclinical testing phase. Actually, let me back up. I want to tell you guys a really fascinating story about how far we've come. Uh, from the time that uh, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, was identified in China, we had the complete genetic sequence of that virus in a matter of days. Uh, that was incredible. And of course, knowing that genetic sequence allowed us to hone specifically into the piece of the genetic sequence that encoded that spike protein that now is encoded in the mRNA vaccines that allows our body to make that spike protein and become immune to the virus. Really, really cool. Um, so when people are like, oh, this happened so quick, yeah, it did. We're a lot better at this. We can sequence genomes like that, and we can make really, really good stuff happen quickly because of how far we've come with this technology. So we already knew from a vaccine perspective, we kind of already had our eyes on a target within days of this virus being identified. That's really, really incredible. Now we get into preclinical testing. That means, hey, we've got a, we've got a potential vaccine here. Is it safe? Well, we're gonna start testing that on cells and culture. You guys might remember from your high school days, your old Petri dish or your flasks with cells in them. Do the cells die when they're exposed to the vaccine? Maybe there's some animals involved. Um, this is part of the ugly truth about vaccines and many products that we rely on. What about, uh, what about uh, animals, you know, mice models? Do the mice survive? If, if those tests come out good, then we move into phase one safety trials where we take a small number of people and we ask the same question, is it safe? Uh, you know, are these people having negative health effects? And if so, what are they? And does it create an immune response? In other words, one, is it safe? And two, is it actually causing our body to make the antibodies that we want to make? Does it work? Assuming we come through that process, we go into phase two, which is expanded. Now what we've done is we've taken that small group of people and we've expanded it to hundreds of people. We're trying to gather more statistics on the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine itself. As you go into phase three, now we've opened this up to thousands of people uh, that are getting the vaccine or a placebo. I think everybody's familiar with what a placebo is. It's a very important part, sort of that blind study process. Uh, that allows the patients to report, you know, what their symptoms are, and we get statistical data out of that. Very important. Uh, emergent, early or limited approval, this emergency authorization step, you still have to go through everything I just rolled through above, um, but maybe we've got to expedite this. Uh, many of you may recall in 2014 and 2015, the Ebola epidemic that was occurring in West Africa. We saw some early approval and emergency authorization of certain therapeutics to uh, help with that situation. So we have the ability to do that. Sometimes we will combine phases. Sometimes these things will overlap. Uh, the goal is that we have to assess the urgency of the situation and figure out what's going to get us, what's going to get us where we need to be without lowering the bar, without changing the standards. Now, here's what's cool. A lot of people are like, well, all these vaccines are only for adults. That's true. We always start with adults. Why? Because we don't care if they die. That's completely false. I just lied. We do care if they die. We want these things to be safe, but we always start with adults first. And as long as those trials go well, which they are, because people are being vaccinated as we speak, okay, now let's move it to a younger age group. We do want children to be vaccinated as well. That's where we are now. So stay tuned. Uh, you can expect in the coming weeks, the coming months to also get approval 
uh, for children to receive this vaccine or these vaccines as well. But the bottom line that we want to point out is that none of the safety criteria have been changed to lower the bar. You know, how did we get this so quickly? We know what coronaviruses are. The mRNA and the viral vector vaccines, they're, they're really sleek. We can, we can do this quickly. Um, obviously, there was huge international concern. We got a huge effort come out of that. Uh, vaccine production capacities, those have increased. And boy, you better believe they're going to keep growing after this. And historically, the bottleneck has usually been in the post-development, you know, that regulatory review phase. It's not uncommon from the time somebody discovers something at the, at the laboratory bench to the time it becomes a product that can be injected into a human for that to be anywhere from 10 to sometimes 30 years. We clearly did not have that time uh, for this situation. So we, we expedited the regulatory review, but we did not change the criteria. Do vaccines really help? Well, this is a, uh, I give credit to CDC for putting this together. On the left, you can see what the pre-vaccine era looked like in terms of morbidity in the US. And on the right, you can see the most recent reports of cases in the US. Very first one is diphtheria. 21,000 annual diphtheria infections, zero today. Uh, just go down the list, but clearly you can see there's a lot of red on the left, a lot of black on the right. Um, so this is, uh, I think what I wanna stress to everybody is what we're doing is not new. We've been doing this for 200 years uh, and it clearly works. Uh, many of us would not be alive today without these. I think that's the, that's the reality of, of where we are. And, you know, for those of you that are interested, this is, as we said at the beginning, this is going to end up on our YouTube channel. Feel free to, you know, pause this. If you like some of the graphics, you want to study some of this more, uh, you're going to have that opportunity. All right. Why might I feel crappy after getting the vaccine? Well, guess what? It takes your body a little bit of work to actually generate an immune response. When you get the vaccine now, your body's got to start making antibodies against it. Because even though the vaccine isn't necessarily harmful, your body recognizes it as foreign, and that's what it's making the antibodies against. So your immune system sort of goes into overdrive. This can actually create symptoms of being ill. I myself have had a flu uh, vaccine. Uh, not This doesn't happen every time I get it, but I've had it in the past where it's like, oh, I feel kind of feverish and achy for a day. That's not uncommon. That's your immune system reacting, but that's not the same thing as you being sick from the vaccine. The vaccine didn't give you a disease or give you an illness. Symptoms usually range in severity, they're, but they're almost always temporary, right? Um, they don't last very long. In most cases, based on the safety testing that you saw uh, in the previous slide, when we go through thousands of people, um, you know, are they, uh, are, they, are they severe? Usually not. If they were severe, we probably would go back to the drawing board. We don't want the vaccine to be worse than the disease. So the symptoms are usually mild and are almost always temporary. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've been really sort of bummed when I see videos pop up now of people sort of faking symptoms uh, to sort of go against the, the validity of vaccines, but people will do that. What about allergic reactions? We hear about this. Yeah, guess what? We're going to be injecting millions of people with vaccines. Is there some small percentage of the population that might find themselves allergic to this? That is a possibility. Uh, in fact, that's a reality. We know that that's going to happen. Are you one of those people? Don't know. Um, I think you have to look at that from a, a history of, uh, there are always warnings, right? So depending on how vaccines are manufactured, there will be some intelligence ahead of to let you know if you might be allergic. Um, but at the same time, some of this, and maybe you've had uh, plenty of vaccinations in the past with no issue. You know, that's good history to suggest that this one probably isn't going to cause a problem either. Uh, but we would be lying if we said that some people won't have an allergic reaction to this. It will happen. So you have to assess the risk of an allergic reaction versus maybe, you know, contracting uh, coronavirus. That's, that's a decision for you to make. We do know that the allergic reactions tend to be in the minority. So what does this all this boil down to? Am I telling you, from my perspective, as somebody who's not paid by a pharmaceutical company or the federal government, do I think it's safe to get the vaccine? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, I can't wait uh, for my, I'm, I'm sure I'm in the very last group being a generally healthy middle-aged male, but uh, I can't wait to get it. 
I miss my I miss my friends and I miss socializing, as I'm sure many of you do. I don't miss pants. I think I made that clear earlier. All right, now we're going to do a little bit of test your knowledge. So get ready for some poll questions. Here we go. Once you're vaccinated, you no longer need to worry about social distancing, face masks, extra hygiene, etc. True or false? I'm going to launch the poll. Poll is open. Cast your vote. All right, we got about 70% of voted. Somebody did ask in the question box, well, how many people are, how many people do we have? You know, 89% out of how many? Got about 120. Collecting responses, we got 76% voting. We'll give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it. I'm going to share it. I'm very proud. 100% of you that voted said this is false, and that is true. That is that is false. Uh, you will have to wear it. Why? Well, it's vaccines are great, right? I mean, depending on which vaccine we're talking about, you've got anywhere from say 70 to 98% protection. I didn't hear anybody say 100% protection. Um, there are a lot of reasons out there that uh, this just doesn't make sense. We do need to continue to do this until we get to a point uh, that you know the majority of people have been vaccinated uh, and, and we've, we've reached that status and we're just not there yet. So good job. All right, next one. I've already had COVID. I was diagnosed, I was sick as a dog, so I don't need to get this vaccine, correct? True or false, launching it now. Got half of you voted. 75% have voted, a few more seconds here. A few more seconds, all right. Let's close it up. Let me share the results. 96% of you said false. 96% of you were correct. If you said true, uh, unfortunately, you were incorrect. Why? Um, well, here's some of the bad news. I think I told you that uh, we continue to learn an awful lot about this virus and the variants. Um, the, one of the questions that we have is, are you going to have long-term immunity to COVID uh, if you have been sick with it? In other words, you got sick, uh, you recovered from it, now I'm immune from it. We don't actually know that. We don't know. In fact, there are cases now where people have been uh, infected a second time. I think we're still fleshing a lot of that out. But to make the assumption that you are uh, immune to COVID or the variants uh, because you've already been sick once, that is a false assumption. So even if you've had the virus, still get the vaccine. If for nothing else, it's a great boost to your, uh, to your current immune system. All right, next one. After I got the vaccine, I developed moderate symptoms, felt kind of crappy, but I'm not contagious to other people. True or false? I'm gonna launch it. Well, this is gonna be a tough one, I can tell. All right, this is awesome. And about 70% have voted. A few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it up. Look at this. Almost an even split between true or false. So this is interesting. So let me ask you guys a couple of questions for you to think about, and I'll, I'll sort of walk through them. Let's say that you've uh, you've just gotten your second shot, right? So you're Pfizer, you gotta get two shots. Um, and you've just gotten your second shot. Are you completely immune from that point? Or, you know, per the vaccine, are you 98% you know, immune at that point? 
Um, the answer is no. It takes your body time to develop the antibodies. Antibodies aren't made in an instant. Uh, it takes time for your immune system to really charge up and develop those antibodies, probably around the 10 to 14 day mark. Here's the other thing is that, you know, are, you, uh, are the vaccines 100% effective? Again, we know that they're, that they're not. So there actually, and there's some others, but there are reasons why just because you've had the vaccine uh, doesn't mean that you are purely 100% immune and cannot infect anybody else. Uh, that actually, this is a bit of a trick question. Uh, we want people to feel comfortable after they get the vaccine that they have absolutely reduced their risk considerably, but it's not 100%. Um, so a little bit of a trick question there. All right, I think we've got one more. Okay, I am pregnant or planning to be pregnant soon. Therefore, I probably need to avoid getting the vaccine for now. Um, this is also a true or false question. I'm gonna launch that one now. See what you guys think. All right, got about half of you voted. Seventy-five percent. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it up. Share the results. Twenty-eight percent of you said true. You should not get the vaccine if you're pregnant or planning to be pregnant. Seventy-two percent of you said false that it's okay to get the vaccine if you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant. Always talk to your medical health care provider, right? I want to stress that. We are not, we are not your family practitioner. Um, but in general, the answer is false. It's okay to, to get this vaccine. Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of data to suggest that this vaccine uh, is unsafe for pregnant women, uh, for the fetus. Uh, quite the contrary, we have plenty of evidence to suggest that it is safe. Um, so the one thing, the way that I flip this around is I say, well, you know, would you, again, it's sort of that risk factor. Would you rather risk getting the vaccine, which has extremely high marks for safety across many types of conditions, including pregnancy, uh, or would you rather risk being pregnant and contract COVID? Um, again, I'm going to go with uh, the vaccine, but always talk to your medical health care uh, professionals about these things, your specific circumstance. In general, the vaccines are absolutely safe uh, for, for pregnant women. All right, that concludes my session now. I'm going to hand it back over to the lovely Sam Dietrich, who's going to talk us through what is going to happen next. Sam, over to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so yeah, so this last section, we're really going to uh, look at uh, what's next and what can we expect uh, in the coming months uh, and really for the rest of uh, 2021. Um, Ryan, if you can uh, back up the slides, please. Um, so in terms of how the pandemic might play out, uh, the reality is COVID isn't, uh, isn't going anywhere anytime soon, right? Uh, we can't magically wave a wand and, and make COVID disappear. Um, so in that respect, 2021 is, is really going to look a lot like 2020. Uh, but I would say that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, until we have about at least 70% of the U.S. population fully vaccinated against COVID, the United States won't be able to return to a sense of, of normalcy. Um, so in that sense, next few months, are going to be pretty pretty rough. Uh, we did make it through the holidays and we're starting to see a decline in the number of hospitalizations and the number of COVID cases, but it's still winter uh, and there are obviously concerns about the variants um, and the efficacy of, of the vaccines. Um, Ryan mentioned this, but we, we really aren't sure how long immunity to the virus will last, whether it's immunity from someone who had COVID uh, and recovered or immunity from uh, getting their vaccination. Um, we also don't know whether seasonality affects COVID spread. We've, we've sort of seen where in the summer months uh, things sort of improved, but it could just be that people were spending more out, you know, time outside and, and less time inside. Um, whereas now that it's winter, no one really wants to go outside, and, and so people are, are starting to gather and, and spend more time in, indoors. So this is something we're still learning. 
Um, and of course, with the vaccine, the rollout um, is important, just as the rollout of the vaccine is um, globally. And there are particular concerns for you know, lower income countries uh, that likely may not be able to offer the vaccine uh, for quite a while yet. Um, in terms of the choices made by governments and, and individuals, um, you know, there are obviously a lot of unknowns. And, and I think this is what I mean here by choice made by governments and individuals. The governments is, you know, obviously if um, there are change in restrictions or guidance um, as we continue to um, know more about COVID and transmission and spread and, you know, the vaccine, um, there may be decisions that are made by the federal government and or the state and local government in terms of restrictions and guidance. Um, so that is, you know, likely going to continue to change as we move forward. Um, and then on the individual side of things, you know, people, um, you know, whether they make that choice to get the vaccine or not, and whether they make that choice to continue to wear face masks or social distance or get together with friends and family, that, that type of thing. So a lot of unknowns um, here as we, as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So times are pretty tough right now, but uh, there is that light um, uh, to the end of the tunnel and, and end is in sight. So if we continue to you know, hunker down, keep uh, our family safe during the remaining coming months and, and monitor our health at home, um, life is going to get better in, in the springtime. It's not all doom and gloom. And we'll talk a little bit more on, on how to kind of get through the next few months uh, shortly. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us sort of thought, OK, end of 2020, what a terrible year. We're now into to 2021. Uh, but it it's, seems like it's still, you know, things really haven't changed. There really wasn't this you know, magical switch that, that was turned off because of the vaccines. Um, and even though there's a lot of hope with the vaccine rollout, um, I would argue that now is still a good time to kind of check in, uh, especially check and close your leaky bubble. Um, and, and what do I mean by this? Um, many people have formed a pod or a bubble, a social bubble that includes two or more households uh, committed to strict precautions so that the group can safely socialize indoors. Uh, but sometimes that bubble is a little bit leakier than you, you may realize. So here's the harsh reality of a virus transmission, right? If someone in your family gets sick, uh, the infection probably came from you, another family member, or someone that they know. So the main way coronavirus is transmitted is through close contact, as we know, with an infected person in an enclosed space. So whether your bubble is just your immediate household or if you formed a bubble uh, with others, it's a good time now to sort of check in with everyone and, and seal any leaks. So this requires everyone to really be honest about the precautions that they're taking or, or maybe not taking. Um, mask up. So. Uh, there's been a lot of data and, and changes, uh, I would say, regarding masks since the, the start of the pandemic. Initially, we were told, OK, just the general public doesn't need to worry about wearing masks. Then the guidance changed that, OK, general public should wear masks, especially when being uh, you know, outside of their, their household and among uh, the public. And then it was changed that masks are required. Uh, basically, every time you leave the house in, in any public place space, you need to wear your mask. Um, but what we have seen is, is the data um, that really does show uh, the impact that masks do have um, and that, you know, they are proven to be effective, um, you know, an effective protective measure. Um, and this is something really, again, we didn't quite realize at first, um, but we know now. Um, and so anytime you're in public or around others that aren't in your household, you want to make sure that you mask up. Um, in terms of when people make decisions about you know, how you're spending your time in winter, uh, you do want to be mindful of the time that you do spend indoors with people who don't necessarily live with you. You want to make sure that if you are going to be around someone who doesn't live with you uh, and you're inside, to wear a mask and keep that visit as short as possible. Uh, or better yet, just don't even, don't even do it at all uh, and take the fun outside. Uh, so what I mean by this, layer up, get some hand warmers, blankets, outdoor heater, whatever. Uh, move social events outdoors uh, just because it's less risky to be outdoors uh, and to, to socialize safely. Um, and I know that goes without saying, uh, but just the, the stress here, the importance of taking care of yourself. Um, so if you do start to feel sick, you may want to get tested for COVID, uh, especially if you're noting some of the, the signs and symptoms commonly associated with the virus, a dry cough, fatigue, headache, fever, loss of sense or smell, um, these are still some of the common symptoms um, that we see among people, you know, with COVID. Um, and then certainly after you take your test, uh, stay isolated from others in case you do have the virus, uh, have the disease, 
um, and that you know you might want to alert those people that you might have uh, spent some time with over the last few, uh, few days until you get your uh, results back. Um, as far as the spring, I mean, I think with the rollout of the vaccine, an end to the pandemic is is in sight, um, and life is going to start feel maybe a little bit more normal um, mid to late 2021. Uh, again, this ultimately really depends on the vaccine rollout and the number of people that do get vaccinated. But all in all, I think we'll, we'll really start to see better days uh, in the springtime. Next slide, Brian. Um, so in terms of the vaccine rollout, uh, just to, to kind of run through this this quickly, um, if, you know, I feel like there's a lot of questions about, you know, how this vaccine rollout, you know, what are the different phases? What do the you know, who's included in the different phases. Um, so here's a breakdown um, in terms of phase one, obviously healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents. Phase 1B as your essential workers, this includes teachers, police, firefighters, uh, utility workers, correction officers, and transportation employees. Then you've got phase 1C, which are adults with underlying health conditions that maybe would put them at significant higher risk of severe COVID. Um, and of course, any adults over the age of 65. Beyond phase one, it hasn't been determined yet. CDC has really just decided phase one for now and, and sort of is, is kind of gonna play this uh, process by ear and, and see you know, how phase one goes before they can make the determination about phase two and, and possibly phase three. Um, so as va the vaccine availability increases, vaccination recommendations are going to expand to include more groups. So. What, are this, what does this mean? What are we looking at here? Uh, you likely won't get the vaccine until late spring or early summer if you don't qualify um, as part of phase 1A, phase 1B, or phase 1C. Next slide. So a lot of questions uh, people have are, you know, when, when is this going to be over? When are things going to get back to normal? Um, and even though the vaccine is distributed at, uh, even if the vaccine is, is distributed at the expected pace, at the current infection level, experts do predict that the country would still likely face a terrible toll uh, during the six months after the vaccine uh, is introduced. So we're still anticipating many Americans are going to get the virus and that many uh, may, may die either from the virus itself or complications related to COVID. Um, there is one positive way to, to look at this. Um, you know, measures that reduce the virus's spread, like the mask wearing, social distancing, and even you know, rapid result testing, these still can have profound um, impacts and, and ultimately save lives. And, and that's why we're sort of at this critical phase right now in terms of you know, people thinking, oh, I'll just get the vaccine, I don't have to worry about anything. And, and as Ryan pointed out, no, you still have to worry about you know, wearing your mask, social distancing, making sure you're washing your hands, et, et cetera, moving forward. Um, so you know, expect restrictions to remain for some time um, and, and well into the year, even once the vaccine again continues to, to roll out, we're still gonna still gonna see that. Um, so just brace yourselves for uh, still a, a tough time ahead of us um, here for a little bit longer. Next slide, Ryan. So in terms of what to expect in 2021, and, and Ryan, you know, had mentioned this at the, the start of the presentation. There's no crystal ball here. We, you know, as healthcare uh, as healthcare professionals and public health expert, it, it's we don't have that crystal ball. We, we're not sure what things are actually gonna look like. Um, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is uh, the leading infectious disease expert here in the United States, had said that by the end of 2021, the US could approach some level of, of normalcy. Um, so what does you know, 2021 look like? And you know, based on what we know, here are some possibilities as to when you might be able to do some activities in a, a post-pandemic world. Um, in terms of vaccines, again, we mentioned that uh, you know, probably by the end of spring, uh, early summer, but, but maybe maybe probably towards the end of the summer is, is when most of the most of the Americans are, are going to be able to get the vaccine for those who want it. Um, and vaccine for you know testing for young children is is has already just started, um, and that we could see kids get vaccinated by the end of this year. In terms of returning to the office, um, you know this is obviously going to vary on. By company, um, but returning to the office, we can probably say that this is going to be the second half of the year. Uh, in terms of um, you know having a large outdoor gathering uh, and doing this without masks, uh, this summer seems likely. In terms of you know having that barbecue, um, being outside where there's better airflow, uh, more room to maintain social distance, obviously safer than doing this indoors. Um, 
for travel. Um, by the looks of you know Instagram, it seems like a lot of people are you know already started traveling again, uh, whether it was for the holidays or maybe just a quick vacation. Um, but really, right now, that's still not advised. Uh, travel increases your chance of spreading and getting COVID. Um, so currently, the CDC says that postponing travel, uh, staying at home, is the best way to protect yourself and others. Uh, in terms of safely eating or drinking indoors at restaurants and bars, we'll, we'll likely see that uh, in the fall. Um, and then for anyone who is, you know, wanting to, has an itch to return to, you know, theaters, whether it's a movie theater or a, a play, a uh, concert without a mask, um, you know, that's probably not going to be till, till the end of the year at the earliest. Uh, and for those of you who might be playing, uh, planning a, a big wedding in, you know, the near future, uh, this is this is something that's going to, you know, any large event, whether it's a wedding or, or just a, a large gathering, we're likely not really going to see this until the spring of 2022. Next slide. Um, so I mentioned travel and, and you know, when is, when is a good time to travel? Um, I know that I haven't been on a plane for almost a year and, and uh, that's uh, it's very rare. This is the longest time I've, I've not uh, gone anywhere, but uh, again, travel increases a person's chance of, of getting and spreading COVID-19. Um, so best thing to do is postpone any travel and, and stay home um, to protect yourself and, and others. But if you do decide to travel, note that uh, it's important to look at the trip as, as a whole and, and all of the factors involved. So uh, what I mean by this is, you know, how are, how are you, it's not just the actual getting on the plane and, and getting to your destination, but how are you going to get to the airport? Uh, as soon as you step out of uh, the door from your house, are you going to get there by car, train, bus, metro, subway, Uber? Um, and then what about going through airport procedures? What does that look like? What about, you know, being on an airplane? Um, you know, is the flight going to be full? Is the middle seat not going to be open? Is someone going to be sitting right next to you? Um, and think about all of these steps all the way to, you know, the, even the activities that you engage in um, once you get to your destination and then doing this all over again to return home. You really can't disassociate the risk um, from each of these steps. Uh, in terms of domestic travel, um, obviously status of the outbreak varies um, from state to state and, and location. So uh, you wanna make sure that if you are gonna be traveling that you check to see what the, the travel restrictions are for your destination. This could include testing requirements, stay at home orders and quarantine requirements upon arrival. Uh, you wanna make sure that you adhere to any state, local, territorial travel restrictions. Um, and for any up-to-date information, travel guidance, you can check your state and local public health department. Um, for international travel, um, there are some countries that have restrictions and requirements uh, for arriving travelers. This can include mandatory testing uh, as soon as you get there. This could also include quarantine. You might have to quarantine yourself for 14 days upon your arrival at the destination. So you wanna make sure you're gonna check whatever the policies are at your destination. Um, and then if you test, positive on your arrival. So those countries that are requiring, um, you know, COVID testing, you may be required to isolate for a period or you may be prevented from even returning to the U.S. as, as scheduled. Uh, recently, CDC just issued a new order requiring all passengers uh, returning to the U.S. or coming into the U.S., including U.S. citizens. They must present a negative COVID test. This can be a little bit tricky, especially if you're coming from a country that, you know, uh, doesn't have uh, a lot of testing available or is very stringent in, in testing, this may be hard for you to do, but U.S. is not going to let you back in uh, if you don't present that negative COVID test. And this is irrespective of whether you, you know, have had COVID or you had the vaccine, you still have to present with a negative COVID test right now. Um, and then, of course, CDC recommends that you get tested after uh, you come back from traveling and that you do stay at home or otherwise quarantine for seven days after travel. Um, until you've got a negative test. So you wanna make sure that you plan accordingly. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. Um, so kind of wrapping it up and then we're, we'll open up for, for questions and answers here. But um, you know, with sort of this tough road uh, yet ahead, uh, how can you be prepared and, and stay safe? And I, I mentioned this critical window of time that we're looking at right now earlier in the presentation. The end game for viral disease outbreaks, particularly respiratory disease is a vaccine which we've, we've got several options, um, but we can do public health measures that are temp tempering things, waiting for the ultimate show chapter, which again is the vaccine. So that's 
why we sort of need to, to keep doubling down even more on public health measures uh, to get through the period when enough people in this country will be vaccinated, uh, that the virus will have no place to go, right? It will be a blanket or an umbrella of herd immunity. Um, so what is it that you can do? Uh, obviously, continue washing your hands regularly. Soap and water is preferable, but if you're out running errands and you can't wash your hands, um, you know, make sure you've, you've got your hand sanitizer and or uh, hand sanitizing wipes available. Wear your mask. Uh, and what's better than one mask, you might ask? The answer is obvious, two masks. Uh, so some medical experts are now starting to float the option of adding a second layer to decrease the risk of getting and spreading COVID-19. It isn't necessarily in all situations, uh, but certainly it can help protect the health of the general public in higher risk situations and know it won't impact your breathing. Uh, the best thing you can do is, is, you know, in terms of doubling up on masks is, um, you know, wearing a, a surgical mask under a cloth mask. Um, and this is probably more, more pertinent to do if you're going to a grocery store or mass transit hub, maybe a doctor's offices, you might want to have that extra level of, of care. Uh, I will say, you know, again, in terms of sort of the guidance changing, particularly around masks, um, this is not reflective of, you know, public health experts uh, like myself and, and, you know, healthcare professionals not being very intelligent people. Uh, this is just due to the fact that this virus is, there's, we, it's a, a novel virus we didn't know very much about at the start of the pandemic and it's continuing to evolve. So we're still learning here and, and that's why, we're constantly seeing changes in, in guidance, but again, not reflective of intelligence or um, you know lack of information or you know any sort of conspiracy of, of you know tricking people or, or putting out faulty claims here. It's just that we didn't have the information that we have now, and we're going to continue to see the information and, and data change um, as we move forward. Um, so anyway, other uh, things to, to help you know stay safe. Uh, we talked about social distancing, keep away from others, especially when you're out and about. You wanna make sure that you don't touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth, limit social gatherings, time spent in crowded places. Um, if anyone in your family is sick, you do want to isolate uh, from them um, and anyone else in the workplace or you know, stay away from anyone who, who might be sick. Make sure you're regularly disinfecting, cleaning, uh, frequently touch objects and surfaces. Um, this includes, you know, even in your home, in terms of the sinks, the light switches, the door handles, you want to make sure you're, you're wiping those down. Uh, and lastly, monitor your health at home. Um, be in tuned until, you know, with signs and symptoms. If you are not feeling that great, um, acknowledge what that might be. Check your temperature. If you've got access to a pulse ox oximeter, um, check your oxygen level. Um, and, you know, make sure you also take care of your, your mental health and well-being as, as well, not just your your physical health, because it's uh, certainly a, a rough, uh, rough time right now. Um, so next slide, Ryan. Um, and this is just really to, to list a couple of reliable sources, where to find information. Obviously, CDC has got a plethora of information, um, but you want to check also your local and state public health department website. And you know those that are interested in, in more of the COVID vaccine data, there's some sites here that list um, some of that, as well as the epidemiology data that we have available. Uh, Ryan, I think we've got another poll, and then I believe we open up to Q&A, correct? We do. Um, so one final poll, then we're gonna start tackling your questions. Um, did this webinar give you new insights into the pandemic or vaccines? In short, was this helpful to you guys today? Um, so I'm going to launch that poll. Got 38%. Few more seconds. Got about 80% voted. All right, this is good. Let's close it up. Share it with you guys. Looks like the vast majority of folks found this pretty helpful. Excellent, we're glad. Um, we know that everybody comes with their own questions and uh, we wanna be able to tackle those. So thank you for submitting your questions. We're gonna get to those now. Um, let's see here. Sam, just to be sure, am I still sharing my screen? You are, yes. Excellent, all right. Q 
Q&A. So I'm going to find the questions here, Sam. I've been looking at a couple of them. Okay. And uh, let's pop those out and I'll run through some of these. Uh, and I also want to mention if we don't get to all of these, which I think is unlikely by the time, we are going to be following up with a written correspondence to everybody who attended today, uh, where we'll consolidate a lot of these um, and we'll do that. So this is a question that I actually don't know the answer to. So boy, Sam, I hope you do. Um, a coworker became seriously ill after receiving their first vaccination, in fact, hospitalized. How does this information get relayed back to vaccine producers? Uh, obviously, this is data that's uh, tracked. Obviously, this is data that does go back to the, the producers, but specifically how? I'm not actually sure. Yeah, no, that is a, that is a great question. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, post um, marketing clinical trials, generally speaking, in, in the pharmaceutical world. And, and I would say, assume that the same would apply for, for vaccines. Um, so, you know, with the vaccine, um, it, it's likely that it's traced to that particular um, vaccine, that sort of make and that distribution information. And, and ultimately it should go back to uh, the maker of, of the vaccine, um, should be reported either by the, the um, doctor treating the, the individual at the hospital um, and, and be reported. But if there is what we call a, a serious adverse reaction, then that is something that definitely gets reported back. Um, and even though the vaccine has been improved, that's something that we are continuing to, to monitor. So uh, in terms of you know, a step-by-step -step approach, I, I'm not entirely sure how that would, how that would go, whether it's, um, you know, I think again, ultimately probably the, the physician at that hospital who treated that particular patient um, would submit the report um, and that report would go to the pharmaceutical company and also uh, likely the FDA as well. Yep, okay, fantastic. Um, here's another interesting uh, question. Actually, this one has come up a lot, so I think it's good to address this. How long do antibodies last after vaccination? And um, uh, a good friend of mine who uh, I actually can't wait to see after I do get a little shot of vaccine, I will go visit again up in Frederick, Maryland, you know who you are, sir, uh, was kind enough to drop a text into our box and say that the latest data reveals that the protective, protective antibodies uh, lasted, you know, at least eight months, you know, following infection. So I think that, you know, that's going to change as we go, right? Um, but right now we're looking at uh, you know multiple months of pr protective antibodies. You know I think that's a that's a good thing. So that's one. Let me find another one here. We've had several good ones. All right, here we go. This is one that I think a lot of people will have questions about. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine appears to be more conventional of the choices. Is you know is it safer to wait till it comes out even though it is 65% successful? or 65% or effective. And really what we're talking about is, is there any difference in safety between sort of the Pfizer or the mRNA vaccines versus the J&J &J sort of the viral vector vaccine? So there's two points in these vaccines, there's safety and there's efficacy. You know, are they safe and do they work? Um, so Sam, weigh in on this one. My opinion is you take whatever one you can get first, right? I'll take 65% over 0% right now. Um, my opinion, the safety standards for all the vaccines across the board that have been uh, reviewed have met the same criteria. What's your take? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think you take what you can get. Um, and, you know, for those that sort of question, well, it's only 65% effective, you have to look at it in terms of that's, um, you know, out of 10 people, six are likely to, to not end up uh, with, uh, to, to have that immunity against the, the virus. So, uh, to me, that's that's worth it than to just kind of hold off and, and wait for another vaccine to come along or until you have access to Pfizer or Moderna. So I would say go ahead, go for it. Yep, yep, okay. Um, so let's see here. The uh, good, good question. We sort of touched on this one, but maybe we can take a little bit of a deeper dive. Why do I still need to wear a mask after I've been vaccinated and I'm making antibodies? And I think the uh, the, the plain and simple facts here is that even though you have been vaccinated and maybe won't develop the disease yourself, uh, doesn't mean that you can't still be a carrier of the disease. So Sam, commentary on that, please. No, I think you're, you're exactly right. Um, wear those masks, uh, wear those masks, consider doubling up, depending um, if you're gonna be around a lot of people in the grocery store, for example, 
um, yeah, just keep up with the masks. Yep. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I think that, you know, we, with the mask campaign really started because uh, they're not, they're not, you know, absolutely foolproof in terms of protecting us from getting the, the or contracting the virus, but it's, it's equally, if not more about protecting your neighbors. So whereas the, the vaccination is really going to help you uh, prevent, uh, prevent getting the disease doesn't mean that you can't pass it on to somebody else. And therefore these things are still very important. Um, we'll do one or two more here while we still have folks on the line, Sam. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and another, another good comment. And we've got some resources here that back to the, sort of the adverse reactions, you know, there is a national database for that. Um, and, and that does get reported that way. We can share some of that. And this is one I think a lot of people have questions about, and it is like, uh, you know, are we likely to need an annual COVID vaccine like we do seasonal flu? Um, my perspective is that's probably likely, right? Um, like most viruses, uh, fl flus are, are similar in this way. They, you know, they mutate, they evolve. There are different strains that come out. We're already seeing this with, with COVID. Um, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that this is going to become another, you know, staple with some frequency. What that frequency is, uh, I think has yet to be determined. Uh, based on you know the, the some more data that's coming in about how long do the antibodies last, how how good are the you know one vaccine against all the variants, et cetera. But it's certainly reasonable to think that this might be a regular recurring vaccine. Um, Sam, do you agree? I do. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously we we don't have that much data available in terms of how long immunity is going to last, right? So um, I think until we have data, uh, we're, we we don't know for sure, um, but I think there some experts are, are saying it is going to be something that is it will be sort of similar to the flu vaccine. That's going to be you know an annual basis um, where you've you've got to get your flu shot and your COVID shot. But we won't know for sure until we get more data about the vaccine. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, we'll pick one more here, and then I think we'll uh, make sure that we address the others in writing afterwards. Let me see if we've got one here that we haven't touched on. Um, well, that's a tough one. See, the nice thing is I get to screen these. I don't have to answer any that I don't, and I don't know. We'll respond in writing after I do some homework, right? That's what we do here. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's this is sort of interesting, Sam. It's like, how many doses do you think you'll have to give to people who were sick with COVID already? So we're saying that even if you've had COVID, still get the vaccination. Do you still have to get you know, for some of the vaccines that require two doses, you still have to go through the through the the full program, and and the answer is yes, right? There's no there's no exception here just because you've had COVID, right? Yeah, good. Okay, um, we're going to wrap it up, guys. We are slightly over time. Um, thank you for joining us today. Again, this will be posted on the uh, the YouTube channel that Merrick has, so this recording will be available. You can pause on some of the parts that you might want to write down. Uh, we will follow up in writing uh, with the questions that we didn't get to today. Um, you will be receiving, I think, a survey at the end of this uh, by email. We would greatly appreciate you taking the, honestly, the two minutes it's going to take to do that survey. Uh, we we always try to make these things good. We want them to be informative and, and we want to get better at doing them as well. So please take the time and do that. Visit the YouTube channel if you'd like to see parts of this again. Uh, we will note, I think that takes about a day or two before we process the recording and get it posted, but certainly by the end of the week, that will be available here. Um, big shout out, obviously, to the lovely Sam Dietrich for, as always, being the, uh, the lead on these things, and uh, also to the, the Merrick team for allowing us the opportunity to do this. Thank you guys for joining. Um, we will keep you updated with more in info and. Uh, Hope you guys stay safe. Keep washing your hands. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.